and here is the second part of growth. There's actually another part of growth um, that you have to learn about, but I'm going to put that with the operations management part of the course, and that's because it belongs there, <laughs> not just because I decided to put it there, but it's about the benefits and the problems of growth, and that goes into more detail about economies of scale because I've been mentioning those quite a bit in these presentations. So it looks like a lot for the, from the specification, but it's not actually that much. So we've got to describe the different methods of expansion, so these types of growth that you can engage in and the benefits and risks of each uh, method. Now, th there will be some specific benefits and risks, but remember from my last presentation, I had um, the slide where I was talking about the benefits of growth. They're going to be similar for all types of growth, so don't be afraid to use those kind of generic benefits of growth as well. So here's my little diagram, methods of growth, and we've got internal or organic growth on one side, and this could be through more shops, more products, or it could be through franchising. So in unit one, we looked at growth from the point of view of an entrepreneur setting up and buying into a franchise and they were the franchisee. Um, we're going to look from this perspective of larger businesses about franchising, so being the franchisor and selling to a franchisee. And then we've got external or inorganic growth and this includes takeovers and mergers. So two different types of growth and within these you can either have takeovers and mergers, we get horizontal integration, vertical excuse me, backward integration. Sometimes it's called backward vertical integration. Usually I call it backward vertical integration, but in the AQA textbook it's vertical backward integration, so that way around, but they mean the same thing. Vertical forward integration and diversification or sometimes call, called conglomerate growth. So organic growth is expansion from within the business and it doesn't involve any other businesses um, when we have organic growth. So a good example of this is Poundland. Uh, yes, everything's pound. Uh, this has been a business that's grown a lot through the last few years, partly due to the recession and people being a little bit more budget conscious. And another type of organic growth could be through selling um, your business as like a franchise um, to uh, franchisees. And Subway has had phenomenal growth over the last 10 years, especially in the UK, a really, really big franchise. Um, and that's one of the ways that they have grown. So the benefits of organic growth when it's just kind of opening up new stores and trying to sell new products, um, it is slow. I know that sounds like a disadvantage, but the benefits of it being slow is it's, it's not going to cost as much as external growth. It's kind of slow and steady. You're not taking over any of the businesses and it's easier to manage those changes as well. Whereas problems slow, it is a problem itself. So it might not be as fast as some shareholders want it to be. Um, and you can't gain from integrating or joining with other businesses so there's a lot of technology that you can share with other businesses or gain from economies of scale or duplication of services and those types of things you're not going to gain that um, when you're using organic growth because you're growing from within if we look at um, becoming a franchisor, so selling the rights to your business, such as the way I have done, um, the benefits are the franchisee is going to be the main part of the arrangement that puts up the money. So there, you know, um, I set my year 10s off with a research class this year um, to, to look at how much it costs to set up a really well-known mm -hmm. franchise. So it could be, um, you know the really well-known ones between uh you know fifty thousand up to kind of half a million pounds that you need to put up um to be able to buy into these franchises so the the franchisee is providing that money so it's going to be a lot cheaper than uh even when we're comparing it to organic growth which is quite a cheap method in itself but it's going to be cheaper because the franchisee is providing a lot of that money the franchisee again is likely to be very motivated because they've got a part in the business they've got um they're, they're going to be able to keep some of this profit so they're going to be more motivated than say just employing a typical manager and there's going to be fewer staff to manage compared to owning each outlet so if Subway had grown by just opening up new stores rather than selling the rights for franchisees to operate these stores they would have a huge number of employees now and that means a huge number of HR regulations um, paperwork to go through managing a huge number of people whereas a franchise or can be quite a large business in terms of revenue and turnover but actually have relatively few employees 
because they just kind of have to employ the head office people. It's the franchisee that are going to um, take care of employing, you know, your people on your tills and things like that and your cooks. However, franchisees can damage the brand if they're not providing the right quality and service. We're going to look at an example of that in a second. And the profits are shared. You're not keeping all of the profits. So this is an article that I found. Now, I just want to say firstly, I love McDonald's. I really do. I yeah I just think the food's great and I could eat in McDonald's it's not healthy to eat at McDonald's every day but I so could because I think they're delicious but I did this slightly put me off the McDonald's brand so these are some of the things that have been found in uh in the last few months in a Japanese McDonald's so pieces of plastic vinyl and the human tooth which you just think how how did a human tooth get in there that's just it's not nice to think of isn't it but it kind of damages the brand a little bit okay so now we're looking at um inorganic growth or external growth so this is a takeover so a takeover is when one business purchases another business um, and we've got Cadbury's that was purchased by Kraft a few years ago. Kraft took over Cadbury's. Uh, Facebook took over WhatsApp um, a few years ago for 19 billion. That's such a huge amount of money, isn't it? 19 billion pounds for that one. Not pounds, sorry, dollars. <laughs> Dollar sign, I'm missing that. Um, Asda took over, or Walmart is the honor. Netto a few years ago as well. So the Netto brand disappeared. Um, years ago a merger is similar but it's it's usually when the two firms kind of come together and decide to operate as one firm so it's it's less about one firm buying another and more about them operating together um, but uh, these are some different types of takeovers or mergers that can occur so if you buy one of your competitors that or merge with the competitor that's horizontal integration if you buy your supplier that is vertical backwards integration. If you buy your customer, that is vertical forwards integration. And if you buy a firm that is in no way related to the business that you're currently in, that is a diversification or sometimes called conglomerate growth. So here's a little diagram that I've got here. And this is, this looks weird, but it's actually a coffee roasting facility. And if they merged with or took over other coffee roasting facilities, that would be horizontal integration because they're taking over their um, competitors and we can see I've put it horizontal so it's all on the same line it's called horizontal integration because what they're saying is it's at the same stage of production in the same industry if this firm merges with or takes over their supplier so here are some people in a field um, harvesting coffee then that would be vertical backwards integration because they're buying their supplier or merging with their supplier. If they buy or take over their customer, which we'd assume would be, you know, coffee shops or any um, retail um, shop or cafe or a restaurant. So if they took over Starbucks, say, that would be vertical forwards integration because they're buying their customer. So that's a, a nice diagram to show you. We can see that vertical integration horizontal integration buying your competitors horizontal buying your supplier or your customer vertical so an example of horizontal integration here asda or walmart buying netto and the benefits you're going to increase your market share because you're reducing your competitors and remember with increased market share customers trust you a little bit more they might be willing to pay a higher price um, people you might um, come across as like market leader um, but also you could you know um, do some unfair things such as um, increasing your prices, uh, limiting competition, those types of things. So that's why the markets and uh, competition authority might be um, quite interested in you. So governments can be a little bit worried about horizontal integration sometimes if it reduces competitors. But um, from the perspective of the business, it can be quite good because you could should be able to make lots of profit. Um, you also might be able to gain economies of scale. So um, I've mentioned this before, but you might only need one marketing and accounting department and you don't need when um, Asda took over Netto, they would have had both both of these businesses would have had their own marketing departments and accounting departments. But going forward, you only need one of the all of those kind of departments so you can unfortunately make some people redundant which isn't great for them but as a business it can actually reduce your um, overheads your operating costs your average overheads that is um, and you get economies of scale so this is when you're operating on a larger scale your average costs are reducing
backwards vertical integration an example would be amazon they bought i think it's pronounced avalon books but they're a book publisher they they publish romance novels and in terms of benefits it guarantees your supply in terms of the the price and the quality as well so you're you are the supplier now if you've bought them so you know you've got a dedicated supply and you can uh you can change that product to meet your own needs and um it's also quite good backwards vertical integration and this stands for all types of horizontal integration and vertical integration but you have expertise in that industry you're buying a firm that is in some way kind of related to you so you should be able to run it quite successfully forwards vertical integration this is Whitbread now these Whitbread run these brands um, which you've probably seen before at least one of them um, but Whitbread actually started off as a brewery um, so making beer uh, I'll call it drinks and um, then they branched out into I think Brewers Fair was one of the first kind of brands that they had um, but you can see that's forwards vertical integration because the brewery making the beer would then one of the the customers would be kind of Brewers Fair um, so the benefits is rather than creating a reliable supplier with backwards uh, integration it creates a reliable buyer for your product so you've got a um, captive captive market there and I, I just thought you know the closer you get to the customer the higher the profit margins tend to be so selling business to consumer which all of these brands are here you know they're selling to the end kind of consumer usually tend to get higher profit margins than b2b so b2b would be you know whitbread making the beer and then selling them to Bruce fair there tends to be um, lower profit margins there so that might be one of the benefits from uh, vertical forward integration now obviously if you sell a greater quantity um, your net profit margin um, doesn't matter um, so much it could be a very slim profit margin and uh, you're just selling in greater quantities so that you're making overall a large amount of profit but you know relate it to the finance part of the course there it's quite interesting okay diversification did you know that the people that own Jaguar Land Rover or Jaguar this is just a Jaguar they're not the same type of car they're just two cars that are uh, made at similar production facilities but the owners of Jaguar also own Tetley T. So very, very different product in no way related to each other. I'm not going to um, say that they are related to each other, but they're all owned by Tata. And that's an Indian firm who own loads of different uh, businesses in different industries. So one of the benefits of diversification is it's less risky than focusing on one market. So it's this kind of phrase, don't put all your eggs in one basket. So if we see in years to come that the automotive um, industry versus a decline or like the luxury market for uh, these types of cars faces decline uh, at least they're still in the market for tea you know or somewhat maybe more likely that tea would face a decline than, than luxury cars but I don't know we don't know what type of transport we're going to have in the future do we self-driving cars and all that kind of thing so the problems of inorganic growth it's going to be really expensive it require it's going to require loans and then you've got interest payments and if it's variable interest rates then you don't know how expensive it's going to be in the future so one of the most expensive acquisitions was Vodafone taking over Manus Man I think that's how it's pronounced and it was taking account of inflation it was 287 billion dollars that's a huge amount of money absolutely huge amount of money it's really expensive you can encounter diseconomies of scale i'm going to go into more detail about that in a um, follow-up presentation and um, that i mentioned at the beginning of the um video and that's going to be on the benefits and problems of growth which is part of the operations uh, management part of the course and it's actually, you know, once you've bought that other firm, not, you know, the first hurdle to get over is how expensive it is. But once you've bought that firm, you can actually get lots of different cultures coming together and they don't always work. So here's an example, AOL Time Warner, which about 2002 or 2001, um, we had this merger acquisition um, and it, it wasn't successful. They, they separated in 2009, but there's estimates that um, over that time that they were merged or uh, um, one had acquired the other one they lost collectively just under 200 billion dollars worth of share value so the shares fell by that amount because of this disastrous merger acquisition so they even when you can afford them and you do they do happen they don't always work so those are the specification objectives uh, don't be afraid of putting the generic benefits and problems of growth in general in there